there's no good transition from hearing about what's going on in Iraq and Gaza, so I don't have one today. But I am a dad with four little kids, or younger kids. Some of them are not little anymore, but they're younger. And so dads come up with stupid jokes, so I want to share some with you today. They're all light bulb jokes, so because they're really stupid. So they're stupid light bulb jokes. You should laugh out of sympathy. I'm just warning you ahead of time. They're really bad. But how many telemarketers does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but they have to do it while you're eating dinner. Thanks for the laugh. So how many NASCAR drivers does it take to screw in a light bulb? None, they only turn left. How many actors does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, they don't like to share the spotlight. How many fishermen, Pastor Rick will like this, how many fishermen does it take to change a light bulb? Five. And you should have seen the light bulb. It must have been this big. It's amazing we could do it with five of us. And how many churchgoers does it take to change a light bulb? Five. One to change it and four to complain about how they like the old one better. <laughs> Today as we come to the word of God, Jesus confronts us with our allegiance often to our treasured traditions rather than to the mission of God. Our fear of change and our aversion often to what God, the new thing God is doing among us. So today we turn our attention to Matthew 15 verses 1 through 20. Hear the word of our Lord for us today. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, Honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus called the crowd to him and said, Listen and understand. What goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that is what defiles them. Then the disciples came to him and asked, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? He replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If the blind lead the blind, both will fall into a pit. Peter said, explain the parable to us. Are you still so dull? Jesus asked them. Don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? But the things that come out of a person's mouth come from the heart, and these defile them. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, slander. These are what defile a person. But eating with unwashed hands does not defile them. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect together on your word this morning, as we seek to understand you and your will for our lives, we ask that you would speak. For we, your children, are ready to listen. Amen. When you read the Bible, do you ever feel like you're, op you're opening someone else's mail? Or that you walked into the middle of a TV show and the characters are familiar, but you don't really get what's going on in the plot? You're confused, a little disoriented. Our, our text can feel that way to some of us today. It can feel a bit obtuse. We think we know where Jesus is going, but how, or where he got, but we don't get how he got there. It's a little confusing. So it might help if we remember a little bit about what's going on with Jesus and these Pharisees. So the Pharisees are a lay movement. They are not priests. They are not official religious leaders. Honestly, they're like all of you. 
They're good churchgoers. They're people who are passionate about God. They're passionate about the Word of God. They want to apply it in their lives. And they want to get people who aren't being faithful, who aren't as passionate, to come on board and join them in trying to follow and please God. They're actually also, though, a little concerned about the priests in Jerusalem. Their concern is that the priests seem, well, corrupt. They've compromised with Rome. They seem to be in it for the money. And so the Pharisees have a lot of mistrust toward the temple and those who are running it. But they honor the law of God. And so one of the things they do is they encourage people, even if they aren't priests, to apply the priestly laws to themselves so that they can act like priests. Because the Old Testament also says that the Jewish people are a royal priesthood. So they are, they are also all priests in some way. They're God's priests to the world, that according to the Pharisees. So they try to apply these priestly laws to themselves. The one that comes into play in our text today comes from Exodus 30, verses 20 and 21, which reads, Whenever the priests enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Also, when they approach the altar to minister by presenting a food offering to the Lord, they shall wash their hands and feet so that they will not die. This is to be a lasting ordinance for Aaron and his descendants for the generations to come. Now, Pharisees weren't priests. They didn't have to go in the temple to offer sacrifices, but they interpreted this text to say that for them, in their tradition, any time you ate, you would treat that food as if it had been sacrificed to God, as an offering back to God. The priests ate the sacrifices on, on, that were given on the altar. So he said, so when you eat, you should wash your hands like the priests do, and then eat the food and treat it as a sacrifice to God, as a gift being given back to God. Jesus' disciples aren't washing their hands. This is not a situation of your mom being upset that you don't wash your hands before dinner. This is about ritual purity. Mind you, no one is washing their hands before they eat except for the Pharisees because the priests are supposed to do that in the temple and in the temple, not at home, in the temple. Unless you're a Pharisee, then you apply it to yourself and if people don't do what you do, you complain and you attack them apparently and that's what's going on in our text today. So the Pharisees come complaining to Jesus that, that his disciples don't act like them, that they're not adding to the law what they've added to the law. They're not following the tradition of the elders. And Jesus says, well, if you think your traditions are so good, let me point out the problem with your traditions. And he says, you have these two laws. The scriptures are very clear that children are supposed to care for their parents when they get old. It is the obligation of a child to provide for the needs of their parents when they get old. If you're over like 65, you should be taking notes right now. Right? It's the obligation, according to Scripture, according to God, of your children to provide for your needs. So Christmas is not about you sending money to them. It's about them sending money to you. Send them a card. Point out that's what God said. See how it goes. But in Jesus' day, this was not a little thing. It was the highest obligation a son would have would be to provide for the needs of his parents as they age. So that's one law that they, they hold in tension. The other law is that if you, if you devote something to the temple, it cannot be used for anything other than at the temple. You cannot break that vow. It is a grievous sin to break a vow to give something to the temple. What was happening in Jesus' day is some unscrupulous children, for no financial gain of their own, but just to tick off mom and dad, were saying, this money I set aside for mom and dad, I'm devoting to the temple instead. See you, mom and dad. Good luck. Hope Social Security that doesn't exist yet is enough for you. And they would move on. And the Pharisees said, according to their tradition, that's the right thing to do if you've devoted that to the, to the temple. That's not sinful. Jesus' point is, you're, honor, you're holding your tradition up, how you weigh these. By the way, we do this too, don't we? Because murder's wrong, right? But you also have stand your ground laws, and then we have to figure out, well, how do they apply when the awful thing happens in someone's house? And that's what judges are for and they figure out what was going on and which law should apply in that situation. We, laws sometimes conflict with one another. So these laws conflict, and the resolution for the Pharisees was they forget the law of God, 
let's stick with our tradition that says vows can't be broken. That matters more than obeying what God told you you had to do. And Jesus says, if that's what your tradition means, your tradition sucks. That's not what Jesus says, but that's the parochial way to say it. It's not a good tradition and we shouldn't follow it. And then Jesus talks, he, he goes back and talking about food, because this is about tradition too. And he says, look, it's not about what you eat, it's about what comes out of your mouth that makes you unclean. For Jews in the first century, there were two primary ways that they defined themselves over against the rest of the culture around them. One was circumcision, and the other was the food that they ate. The third would be Sabbath observance. The food that they ate was vital. Everybody knew Jews don't eat pork. Jews don't eat shellfish. Jews are different because they won't eat food sacrificed to idols in other temples. Jews are weird. Everybody knew. And for Jews, there was a certain amount of pride in that because by what we eat, we demonstrate that we belong to God, that we are holy, that we, we are separate from the world. We're better than in some way, that we are the chosen people of God. And Jesus says, it's not the food you eat, it's what you say that determines your holiness and your separateness from the world. What is your heart really like, Jesus asks. Now most of us today aren't going around condemning people because they don't wash their hands long enough. By the way, I learned you're supposed to wash them this long. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Life is but a dream. So if people don't wash them that long, send them back in the bathroom. It doesn't do any good. They didn't get their hands clean. They just got them wet. All right, so that's how you wash your hands. But we're not going to, you're not going to actually do that today. Are you going to go condemn someone for not washing their hands while singing row, row, row your boat? No, we don't go around doing that very often, except moms of preschoolers, they do that. No one else does that, not to your husband, just to the kids. So, and most of us aren't too worried about if you're having pork today or not. In fact, some of you are thinking, I hope that's what's in the crock pot. Pork sounds really good today. We're not worried about that too much. But it makes me wonder, are there ways sometimes that we can fall into the same trap of valuing our traditions ahead of the law and the mission of God? Are there ways that we can value our traditions and our habits over the actual word of God and God's call on our lives? I was thinking about this a couple weeks ago as I met with pastors. You should know that sometimes when pastors get together, they complain. It's not very becoming but this was one of those times. So I was talking with, with a pastor friend of mine, and he was telling me a story of meeting with some people in his church about decorations. I want to be clear before I tell this story. I don't have a horse in this race. Do not blame me. I don't care, just to be clear. But it was about flowers on their communion table. He, some, they, this is a church that had been struggling, and they, and they were they're reaching new people in their community. They had grown from like 30 to like 50 or 60 in worship. Most of them were younger people, but there was this older group that had been there for like 30 or 40 years. And the younger people said, our church feels like my grandma's church because it was decorated by my grandma. And so they wanted to talk about redecorating the church. And part of it was taking the flowers off the communion table because it looked like grandma's flowers. How long do you think they talked about this? Think a 10-minute conversation? 30? 50? An hour? Two hours they talked about whether or not they should take the flowers off the communion table. I don't really have an opinion on whether they should take the flowers off the communion table. I don't care what they did with their flowers. But the argument was that it looks like grandma's church or... My best friend gave those flowers because they were fake flowers to the church. And what do you do when your best friend's flowers, when someone's take them off? In our culture, the danger for most people is that we will preference change over the word of God. Because we love change, we love youth and new things. But there's also a strain in the church that we can hold on pretty close to our traditions over weird, silly things. And we can put that over against the mission of the church. It breaks my heart, and I don't care what they did with the flowers, but that you would spend two hours debating what to do with flowers on your communion table rather than spend two hours talking with these young people who are just coming back to Jesus. That seems like a better use of everybody's time. I was, I was feeling kind of proud of all of you because I think about all the stuff we do in our church. 
I mean, we took the chairs out of our sanctuary and we let kids play games with balls in here this summer. You guys are willing to try a lot. And I was feeling kind of proud. And honestly, I was puffed up with pride as I was thinking about this story. And then I walked into the workroom in the back of our office the, the other day and I saw a stack of these and I saw a stack of these and I wasn't so proud anymore. So let me tell you why. Because I hear rumors, because no one dares tell me directly that people don't like filling out the connection cards. <laughs> you might have known, just some of you don't like filling it out, right? Yeah, because it's different. I've even had people put notes on the back of them, which is nice. They signed it, so I know who it was, about how they really don't like these, and this is a really dumb idea and a waste of money. And that's fine. You can think that too. But seriously, how much different is it to sign this over signing the fellowship pad? Is it worth the anxiety some people are carrying? I've, heard, I've, had, I've heard that some people say they won't sign it out of the principle of the matter. I don't know what the principle is. <laughs> I would love to know what principle is at stake in signing one or the other. But then I thought to myself, you know what? You guys get mission and that's what you care about. So maybe I haven't told you why we did this. So can I tell you, this is a total sidebar conversation. This is not the sermon. This is a pastor sharing a stupid thing about why we made a change. So this is not sermon, this is just sidebar. So I've been here for like 10 years now. And in those 10 years, I can tell you on one hand the number of times someone who visited our church for the first time gave us their address or phone number in the fellowship pad. One hand. In fact, I can tell you most of you who've come here since, came here since I've been here, when you joined was when we found out what your address was. Because we make you fill a form out when you join so we know what your address and phone number are because we never got it through this. So I was meeting with um, Doug McClintock who's at a church planting for the regional synod and I was sharing with him my frustration of how do we help visitors get connected in our church and he said, well, first of all, fellowship pads won't help because your members will sign their name and visitors will follow suit. And they'll come for months and you'll never have a way to contact them outside of Sunday morning worship. He said, so what we do is we use these silly, stupid connection cards because visitors don't know that your members just put their name on it. And so instead, the visitor gives you the email address and their phone number and their, their, their home address. And now you can call them and you can email them and you can send, the, send them a letter thanking them for coming. And they're more likely to come back. Isn't that neat? And it's amazing. I send an, a couple emails out every single week now to visitors who come to our church for the first time because we can. They get it within 24 hours of coming to church. And often we email back and forth throughout the week about our church. That has never happened in 10 years till we made this change in July. So that's why we did it missionally. Let me tell you the weird benefit I'm finding from it too. On the back, people share prayer requests. And they're actually specific because Everyone in their aisle doesn't see that they, want, that they want the pastor to pray for what's going on in their marriage because it makes it safe to share what's really going on in their lives. And now on a typical Monday morning, I sit in my office and I have six to ten of these cards with prayer requests from all of you and I'll spend 20 to 30 minutes praying for specific requests from our church and then I send an email letting them know that I prayed for them. It is the highlight of my week getting prayer requests from all of you. So, I'm asking you to fill this connection card out because it's about mission. It's about making sure our visitors get connected. Can, it's also how our um, elders keep track of who's here. So if you don't sign it, they call you. You really don't want to talk to our elders. They're scary. Uh, they're really not, but maybe you don't want to talk to them. So that's how you avoid having the elders call. But honestly, for me, it feeds me spiritually to pray for all of you. So if you fill one out and put a prayer request on it, it makes me feel better. And it makes me pray better for all of you. And so I love that. So that's my sidebar comment. I'm going to put my connection card in the offering plate so I don't forget. All right, now back to the sermon. So sometimes change is hard because it's hard to fill out a connection card instead of the fellowship pad because it's different and it's just weird. And so we can struggle with change sometimes too. We probably aren't that different than the Pharisees that we can value our tradition maybe more than we should. The Pharisees are also pretty good at picking the rules that they want to apply. They pick between offerings to the temple and caring for their parents. And I'd like to think that we never do that. But then when I look at the lists of sin that the Bible says we should care about, I realize maybe I pick and choose too. This is what Paul says in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Paul writes, I think we have that up there. We do. The acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty clear indictment of that kind of behavior, right? Or indictment of that kind of behavior. You won't inherit the kingdom of God. Thankfully, none of us ever commit any of those sins, right? We would never do any of those, or at least we would never do the ones that we like to condemn, like idolatry and witchcraft. Most of us haven't done witchcraft lately, and we're not sacrificing to idols. And there's no orgies going on, I hope. There's none of that kind of stuff, right? So we can condemn that pretty safely, but then you have to learn how Paul defines idolatry in Colossians 3, 5. This is what Paul writes to define idolatry. Idolatry is, se- uh, is sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Now to be clear, which is idolatry applies to sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed. So it's all of those. But think about your experience of the church. We've all heard of people who've gotten into trouble in church as pastors or as other leaders because of sexual sins or that kind of immorality. But have you ever heard of the elders going to talk to someone about their greed because they went deep into debt to buy a nice new car? More than they could afford? Have you ever heard of someone having to go in front of the elders to talk about how they built a huge fancy house and was that really the right thing to do? when they had to go deep into debt to do it? Have you ever heard of someone having to go before the elders because they're a glutton? We pick and choose the sins we want to condemn, don't we? We pick and choose the sins that we don't see in here that we see out there. Or we condemn the sins that we can hide in here so no one has to know it's our sin and it's safe to condemn it because no one knows we're really talking about us. But the sins that are obvious, we like to pretend aren't even there. We pick and choose the word of God we want to apply to our lives. But Jesus says it all applies. We have to submit to all of the word of God, even the stuff that applies directly to us. Gossip and slander. Churches are great at gossip. That's one of our strengths, often. But we don't condemn it, even though it's what we all do. Jesus says all of the word of God needs to apply. You can't pick and choose. Then he goes on and he talks about really outward appearance, those outward ways that they showed their allegiance to God, the eating of the right kinds of food. We need to be careful that we don't judge people by their outward appearance, but we need to look at the heart like God does. God doesn't care what you eat. God doesn't care what kind of clothes you you wear to church. God doesn't care what kind of job you have. God doesn't care about the tattoos that you have. God cares about your heart, whether or not you are becoming more and more in your character, in your lifestyle like Jesus. I was thinking about this this past week as I remembered two pastors, somewhat famous pastors. One used to be next door, Rob Bell at Mars Hill. The other is also at Mars Hill. He's at the Mars Hill in Seattle. Not affiliated with the Mars Hill in Granville. They're very clear on that. They don't like one another. Mark Driscoll is the pastor at Mars Hill in Seattle. So several years ago, Rob Bell next door came out with a book that offended a lot of evangelicals. Some of them even put out in social media, goodbye, Rob Bell, because you're off the reservation. You can't be among us if you, if you don't think the things we do about hell and that kind of stuff. I don't agree with Rob Bell's book on hell. I just wanted to put that out there. I don't agree with Rob Bell on some of his theology. But I do know people who know Rob really well. I have a friend who went through seminary with Rob. I have another friend who played soccer with Rob every single week for like eight years. Year in, year out. Every week they got together and played soccer. So he knows him well. And what both of my friends who know Rob pretty well have told me is that Rob is one of the kindest people you'll meet. He is generous. He is gracious toward people who sin against him and who say mean things about him. He is passionate about the word of God and he's deeply in love with Jesus and his heart breaks for people who don't know God. But he's off the reservation because he didn't meet a certain criteria of outwardly what good Christians ought to say and think. Then I thought about Mark Driscoll. Mark Driscoll is kind of the anti-Rob Bell in that 
he's about as orthodox as you come. He's very conservative in his theology. If you listen to his sermons, you won't find anything you get upset about. He won't push any boundaries. Well, he might say things that are offensive sometimes, but it's not theologically offensive. He's a little out there sometimes. He wears a bulletproof vest when he preaches because he's had so many death threats for the things that he says. So he's a, he can be a, very, a bit controversial. But he's very theologically sound. Over the last several years, but specifically the last month or so, he has had numerous former staff members write letters to their board complaining about his, his behavior, how he treats the people he works with. Recently, nine of his current staff wrote a letter to the board asking them to discipline Mark and have him step aside to deal with his issues. He is abusive to staff, according to them. This isn't just the nine. There's like 20 some other people who sent letters in the past. He's abusive to his staff. He uses coarse language. He's manipulative. His character does not reflect Christ at all even though his theology is great. This is not new information about Mark Driscoll. It's been known for years. It took years for other leaders in the evangelical church to say, your heart matters as much as your theology. Jesus says, your heart matters to God as much as your outward appearance, as much as your theology, as much as your traditions that you hold to. God cares about your heart. Who are you on the inside? So let me ask you this. Who are you on the inside? When you're not thinking about anything at all, what do you think about? Where does your mind go? I was thinking about this while I was mowing my lawn because there's, there's nothing to do while you mow your lawn. You're walking in a straight line. So I can do that pretty well usually. So I was thinking about what I think about when I'm not thinking about anything while I mowed my lawn. So I tried not to think about anything while I mowed my lawn and see what came to mind. This is what I realized I think about. Almost every time I mow my lawn, I think about how can I pay for my kids to go to college? That's what I think about. I think about, well, how much money to put away and what kind of scholarships could they get? Because I really want them to go to Kelvin or Hope. And by that, I mean Kelvin. And I was thinking about this. And then this past week, I was thinking, you know, I got an email this week from Publishers Clearing Our Sweepstakes that I could win $5,000 a week for life. I should send that in because then I could win and my kids could go to Kelvin and I started feeling pretty happy about it because, I mean, if I prayed hard enough, God, that's not how it worked, just to be clear. Maybe I'd win. And then I realized my kids went to a camp at Hope this summer and they both have told me they don't want to go to Kelvin, they want to go to Hope. So then I started thinking, how can I not pay for my kids to go to college? Because, no, I'm kidding. But it made me think, so I started thinking about that. I started thinking, what of my idols, if I examine what I think about, Honestly, probably isn't the money, it's my kid's future. And I can, I can worry about and put all my energy and think about how do I give my kids the career and the future that I want them to have rather than trusting God to give them the future he has planned for them. I carry a burden that doesn't belong to me. It's God's, it, they're God's kids, they're child of the king, it says on their little name tag, right? They belong to God, it's his job to worry about that, not mine, it's my job to be faithful today. But I can, idolatry, I, I can turn their future into my idol that I spend my life seeking. When you're not thinking about anything at all, where does your mind naturally go? It might give you a clue what the idol is that's ruling your life. Or when, when things don't go your way, when you're mowing your lawn for the second time this week and your lawnmower dies before you're done, not that that happened to me this week, twice. Twice. How do you respond the second time. The first time, I did great. Second time, I actually did pretty well, too. I went inside and said, I guess I don't have to mow the lawn. But what do you do when your lawnmower quits working? When things don't go the way you want, what kind of words come to mind? Do you have to bite your tongue to keep them from coming out of your mouth? When, when your kids don't do what they're supposed to, what kind of attitude do you have when you try to talk to them about it? When your parents aren't doing well health-wise, you're dealing with all of the red tape of nursing homes and Medicare and all of that rigmarole, and someone doesn't do what you, what you thought they were supposed to do, how do you respond? Do you blow up at them or not? It might give you a hint of what's going on in your heart. Jesus says God doesn't care about the outside. He cares about the inside. What's going on in your heart? If you do this kind of soul searching, what you're going to discover is that you're not very clean on the inside. 
None of us are very clean on the inside. I'm not clean on the inside either. And no matter how much spiritual scrubbing you do to clean your heart, no matter how much bleach you want to pour down on your, spiritual bleach, not actual bleach, on your heart, no matter how many fresh coats of paint you try to put on your heart to make it look clean, it'll still be dirty. This is not something you can clean on your own. What you need is a new inside. The good news of the gospel is that that's what Jesus came to give you. 1 Peter 1 verse 3 says this. Hopefully. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The hope of the gospel is not that you can be good enough if you try harder. The hope of the gospel is not that if you just go to church enough, then God will love you. The hope of the gospel is that you are a broken, messed up person and God loves you anyway, and he's in the business of taking broken, messed up people and making them whole and making them new. This is what Jesus came to do. Not so that you can be good enough, but so that he can make you in his image so that your insides begin to shine like his as you reflect the glory of our God. Believe this gospel and go forth to live in its peace. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today. We thank you that you have loved us as the broken, messed up people we are and that you are in the business of making us clean. Help us today to let go of our traditions that we want to hold on to and instead seek your mission to submit ourselves to the full authority to all of your word and to focus not on the outside of ourselves or others, but instead to seek to change our insides, to allow you to transform us and make us whole and new again by the power of your Spirit. We pray this in your Son's name. Amen. Amen.